Hi, everyone. This is Patrick. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode. It's episode two of our season on investing. And I have a guest on who, as you guys will soon listen to or see, depending on whether you're watching this on YouTube or, or listening to it uh, on, the, on a podcast app, has a philosophy on, on money and investment that ties almost perfectly into the previous seasons that we've that we've done and, and the different topics we've focused on. So if you guys are new listeners to the Wall Standard Podcast, go back and check out those seasons. In 2018, we had three seasons, one on life, one on liberty, and one on property. And then in 2019, we focused on capitalism. And uh, the second season was entrepreneurship. Now, Thomas Jones, as we kind of have this capstone season of investment, uh, Thomas Jones has the typical background, but as you will see, what he's learned when it comes to principles, when he's learned as it as it comes as it pertains to you know the attributes to acquire in order to achieve success, we're right in line. It's amazing. So Thomas Jones is the former vice chairman, president, and COO at TIAA Cref. So he's held quite a few executive level uh, positions there. So TIAA Cref is the largest pension system in the country. He is also the former vice chairman of Travelers, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and Freddie Mac. He's the former chairman and CEO of Smith Barney Asset Management, former CEO of Global Investment Management at Citigroup, the former treasurer at John Hancock Insurance Company. He is the founder and senior partner of venture capital investment firm TWJ Capital and is the author of his new book, From Willard Straight to Wall Street, a memoir. Now, Thomas is not necessarily used to doing video interviews. And so even though this will be on interview or on video, he is uh, facing another direction. And so it might be best for you just to uh, to listen to it. Uh, but Thomas Jones and I, we had a great conversation and you guys will really enjoy it. It's a perfect episode to interview because it, it covers some very general things, but also highlights a perfect tie-in to our previous seasons and what it takes to become a successful uh, not just investor, but successful person in general. Without further ado, please enjoy my interview with Thomas Jones. Hey everyone, this is Patrick. Thank you for joining me on one of the, the first episodes of this season on investment and investment theory. And I have the honor, it truly is an honor to, to speak with this gentleman. His name's uh, Thomas Jones. And uh, Thomas is a former vice chairman, president, and COO at TIAA CREF, uh, which is, for those of you who don't know, it's, uh, it's the largest pension system in, in the country, one of the biggest uh, financial firms in the country. He's also the former vice chairman of Travelers, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and Freddie Mac. He's also the uh, former chairman and CEO of Smith Barney Asset Management, the former CEO of Global Investment Management at Citigroup. Uh, the former treasurer at John Hancock Insurance Company, the founder and senior partner of uh, the venture capital investment firm, TWJ Capital, and is also the author of a new book called From Willard Straight to Wall Street. And I think you were also, Thomas, correct me if I'm wrong, but were you also a part of ICI, the investment company? Uh, I was on the board at, at Investment Company Institute for a number oh. of years. So you, <laughs> of anyone... <laughs> Right to understand really the uh, how investment has changed over the years, as well as different types of investment, different type of companies within financial services. Uh, Tom, I, I can't wait to can't can't wait to have this interview. So I thought it would be be great to start with some some context, just to to for the listeners, the audience, to understand your your perspective on, on things. So I'd love to know as you were. You know, growing up and as you kind of got into financial services and in your in your career, who who was one of uh, your your role models, a person that that in, inspired you? You know, either someone you knew, somebody you didn't know. Like, what, what who were some of those instrumental people that kind of helped form uh, what you decided to do with your life? Well, uh, I would say one of the most significant role models was John Bogle, who you know created the modern index fund. And uh, as an experienced investor, uh, understood the various characteristics of risk in both the equity and fixed income markets in the US. And <clears throat> through a long period of experience, 
had reached the conclusion that it was really low probability that the average investor was going to outperform the average performance in efficient capital markets, such as have evolved in the US, and came up with this idea that uh, the most likely way to uh, deliver efficient returns relative to risk for the average investor was to minimize the cost of making those investments so that the net return over time would be maximized in the way that it compounded itself. And I just thought it was magnificent that somebody as brilliant as that would focus on trying to create a product that was uh, designed to serve the common man, so to speak, you know, designed for the average investor and acceptable, you know, accessible to investors who weren't necessarily wealthy, uh, you know, with large sums to invest and able to pay high fees. And that was so contra to the standard Wall Street model. I just, I just admired what he was doing. Yeah, that was one of those kind of earthquakes in, in financial services. And I think it's just continued to compound where technology is on the scene now and you know, just the awareness of information has uh, pushed fees, expenses, transparent, you know, it's pushed all those down and transparency up. And, and he definitely well, was- It was interesting, you know, in the early it. going, index funds didn't attract much of a, much of a follow. And uh, uh, frankly, and index funds came, came uh, onto the scene in the late 50s and uh, early 60s. And, weren't considered to be much of a factor in the market for maybe 25 or 30 years. And it's then only in the last 25 or 30 years that it's really become powerfully evident that most active investors cannot consistently outperform an efficient index fund. There will be some outperformers every year but the problem is that most investors can't identify them in advance. So nope. it doesn't it's too late is. by the time they know. <laughs> yeah. And their track record isn't that way going forward once they have actually outperformed it. In one That's year. very true also. That's very true also. Well, listen, I thought another another question which would be which would be helpful, you know, for me to understand uh, you know, the the career you've had, the success that you that you've had and the difference that you've made. Is to understand, you know, maybe a, a, a superhero or a, a, a figure in history uh, that has done amazing things here, you know, uh, hero driven things. Who have you most resonated with that maybe fits that, fits that criteria? Well, uh, you know, I was a bit of a student revolutionary in the 1960s. The cover of my book, Willard Straight to Wall Street, shows me uh, with a gun exiting Willard Strait Hall at Cornell University in 1969. Now, that was a Pulitzer Prize winning photograph on the cover of Newsweek magazine in April 1969, because I thought my generation of African Americans was tasked by history to stand up and fight over the historical oppression that we had suffered in this country, and to say that it had to end in our time. And in that context, um, my hero, one of the people that I most admired was Martin Luther King Jr. I mean, the way that he had changed the, uh, the, the conversation in this country, you know, to have hundreds of thousands of people doing things like participating in the March on Washington in 1963 and just shaming America by personifying this high moral standard and saying that, that he was going to lead a movement that, that epitomized that high moral standard by being a nonviolent movement and responding to hatred with love. I just thought that was admirable um, and, and courageous and I admire him for doing that. Now, of course, me, coming out of Willard Strait Hall with a gun was not a statement of love. It was <laughs> a statement of resistance. But I admired 
the way that Martin Luther King had elevated the civil rights movement and given it so much momentum. Well, it's, it's interesting, you know, the, this, I always refer to, you know, some of the most inspirational, uh, you know, energetic, motivational speeches of, of, of all time came from Martin Luther King Jr. And, and, you know, it's interesting. The reason why I asked the question that I did is, you know, you, you have figures in history or even, you know, the, uh, in, the, in the fiction world, right, that, that play this, this role and have this uh, presence and state that I think is contagious to certain people that they, they resonate and, and, and essentially take on to their character. And I think it's, I think it's fascinating because a person uh, that stood for what's right and a person that faced odds that were not in their favor, okay, uh, conquered and made a massive difference and another kind of earthquake in the, uh, in the world, right, that set a new precedent. And so that's, that's awesome to hear uh, about some of your heroes. Um, so I would say another question is what are some of the charitable causes that you, uh, that you have represented or, or continue to represent or support? Uh, the one that's closest to my heart was a school in central Harlem, St. Aloysius school, uh, which, uh, was focused on, um, serving low income, uh, predominantly, uh, black and Hispanic children in elementary and middle school. And I, I became familiar with them in 1993 when um, I was a I became the president of TIAA CREF. There were a lot of newspaper articles about me and so on. And in one of those stories, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, I said that one of the ways I would like to make a difference was to support uh, educational opportunities for inner city children, uh, helping them to get better opportunities than were typically afforded to them. And a lady, the lady who uh, was the head of St. Aloysius School, contacted me and said that, you know, if you're serious about what you're saying, you ought to visit us because maybe instead of starting something new, you ought to work with somebody like me who's already in process. And I, I followed up on that and went to visit her, and it was just remarkable. She had these kids, the average kid, you know, she had no special selection procedures other than you had to have a positive attitude. You had to be a person that wanted to engage positively with adults. And she oriented these kids through things like oratory, and not just the, the reading and the mathematics and so on, but oratory, you know, where they would give basically, you know, like some of the great speeches that you would find in history and learning how to both understand those concepts and how do you speak powerfully, how do you speak resonantly, how do you speak emotionally, and and through that process, kind of imagining themselves being in the shoes, in the footsteps of the great people whose speeches they were giving. And um, in visiting her school, and, and she also had side uh, excursion, you know, going to museums around New York City, uh, going to Broadway shows, and it, it just opened up. Uh, it opened the eyes of these children to see what might be some of the possibilities beyond the daily horizons that normally uh, were their experience. And I was so impressed that uh, we partnered with them. We did, we, uh, I started a program that was called The Courage to Succeed. And I called it The Courage to Succeed because in a lot of inner city communities, there's a culture that beats you back from success. You know, there's a culture uh, sometimes where the kid who studies hard, the kid who really tries to succeed in school, you know, that they're teased. Well, that's not really black. You know, that's not really cool. I mean, I had faced that same kind of thing coming up in my own life where I skipped mm -hmm. two grades and, you know, that's not cool, you know. And But I was... I. I had a mental shell that, you know, 
hard to think about, but I know these kids, it takes courage to face that kind of lack of cultural support. So I named the program the Courage to Succeed. And what we did was donate computer equipment to the school with uh, technicians from TIAA CREP volunteering a couple of hours a week to go work in shifts to teach the kids various programming schools and you know how to use the computers and the software that we were giving them. And then the second thing was I recruited prominent successful business people, African American and Hispanic business people to come and talk at the school uh, and tell their stories so that the kids could identify with that's somebody that looks like me and look what, how successful they are. And if they can do it, I can do it too. And then the third thing I did was we, we, uh, we were a sponsor of their annual fundraising efforts. So we, you know, we had an annual gala, annual awards event, which would raise about five or six hundred thousand dollars a year to support scholarships for the families uh, that could not pay the modest tuition, two or three thousand dollars. But that's something that not every family is able to pay. So we raised the money to support scholarships for the kids. So that that's been my favorite philanthropic endeavor. <laughs> Well, I look at, you know, making a difference and, you know, I, I would say some of the stereotype with charities is you exchange money, right, and, and support them because of their cause. But instead of that, it seems like uh, you help to uh, perpetuate their cause, right, by making a difference where it's not just giving uh, fish, but it's teaching how to fish. I think that's a, that's yeah, a it's profound, a, yeah, profound trying story. Trying to teach people how to fish, how to support themselves how to be confident in themselves, how to lift themselves, just how to see a way, how to see a road, how to see what an opportunity might look like. It's, yeah, it's amazing. We can go off on, on that topic for the entire podcast because, you know, just the amount of influence that, that children have, especially around the teenage years when their bodies are changing, the, the chemicals in their brain are changing. I mean, there's a huge part of their perspective that, lingers throughout their entire adulthood that's formed in those, in those, uh, in those years. And, you know, I, I look at just how profoundly in good ways or bad ways, depending on the environment, uh, how school influences that. Uh, but anyway, we, we could, <laughs> we could probably go, go off on that, but I, I want to get to just one other, one other question for context, and then we can get into some of the meat, meat of the interview. Uh, but I'm, I'm so grateful to you for uh, answering the questions the way that you are, because, you know, it shows who you are. Right, and it shows what you care about, and maybe the purpose behind uh, what you what you do. So the last the last question I have for you is: What is from, from a legacy perspective, leaving your legacy? What is what is an attribute that you, uh, if you could choose just one, an attribute that you could impress on your children, your grandchildren, uh, the world, and and perhaps th this audience? Like, what would that what would that attribute be? Well, if I had to pick just one, uh, it would be something I talk about in my, in my memoir. And it's the lesson I learned of the significance of giving 100% effort every day to try to excel at what you do. You know, and, and it's a lesson I learned because when I started out in my career in the early 70s, I basically thought I had no chance at all. Now, I was going into the business world because I thought that's where the toughest battle would be as America seemed to be opening up to uh, more integration and inclusion and uh, racial equality. But I thought the business world would be the toughest battle because that's where the wealth is. And I thought I would have next to no chance whatsoever because I was branded as the black radical from Cornell. But I wanted to give it my best shot anyway. And so as I thought about how to approach it and thinking, you know, it's, it's really unlikely that you're going to succeed here, I, I concluded that you have to have a framework of reference for success 
that you can control for yourself and you can't be psychologically dependent on those around you to define whether or not you're successful or not. And my conclusion was the only things I could control were my attitude, my demeanor, my work effort, okay, my product output, you know, and that that Okay, if, if I had a positive attitude, if I always carried myself in a way that was respectful and friendly towards others, and if I gave a 100% commitment to do my best every day, that that could be my personal scorecard. And every day I could grade myself on, did you do that today? And, you know, things might not work out, at all in the context of the companies and my assignments, you know, I might get fired any day. But if I could give myself that scorecard every day, then that was the best I could do. And I should be proud of that. And I discovered, as I made that commitment, I discovered that operating at a 100% commitment to try to excel every day is very different than 90 or 95%. And that I had been socialized, like most of us, you're socialized in school, a 90 or a 95 is an A, and an A is the best you can do, right? So you should be satisfied with that. And in fact, you know, I, I discovered that there's a big difference between 95 and 100. It may not seem like a lot on any given exam. I mean, who cares? You know, you got 100, I got a 95, big deal. What does five points mean? It may not mean that much on any given work assignment. Okay, it's hard because you get it in the shades of gray about, you know, the quality and so on. But that five points of differential effort and commitment, if it's compounded every day, day after day, and week after week, and month after month, it becomes an enormous reservoir of differential effort and likely achievement that sets you apart. And that was the basis of my career because I, I, did, not, I did not know it at the time, but the most successful people in corporate America, the guys that reach the top, are guys that build teams. You know, they can't, one of the reasons they're at the top is because they have good teams. They can't do all the work themselves. And one of the ways they build teams, they're like sports coaches. They're always on the outlook for talent, people that they want to try to bring onto their team. And I did not realize it at the time, but some senior guys began to pay attention to me. I guess they had heard about me. They, they began to pay attention and people would just kind of show up if I was doing a presentation or, you know, I would find that a report that I had written might have been read by a number of different people who would then ask me questions about it. And people would begin to approach me. Uh, both of, but always it started with just discussions about work, you know, conversations about my work efforts, my projects, my clients, and so on. Then it would slowly inch into asking me about my family and my background and uh, kind of what my goals were. And then it would go a little bit broader into, you know, broader social, my, my, you know, they would invite my wife and I maybe to dinner or something like that. And ultimately I was adopted by, you know, a whole series of people who became my mentors and, you know, they gave me the promotions and the compensation increases and protection. And I did need protection because, you know, they were not, not everybody wanted me to be in the company. And there were people who would have, who would have fired me because I was the black radical from Cornell and, you know, people like you don't belong here. Um, but I got protection and, you know, promotions and compensation and my men it, it, that mentorship is a reciprocal relationship. You know, I made them look good by the work I did, and they took care of me. So just to come full circle, the point I would make is I learned through that 100% effort to achieve what I call self-actualization. 
self-actualization is your highest potential. And you don't really know what your highest potential is until you put a 100% effort into trying to get there. And it was, I learned through doing that, it was a spiritual gift to myself because it was so, not only was it, you know, kind of successful in a career sense, a job sense, but I felt so spiritually uplifted. Just the joy of knowing that you're achieving your highest potential and being everything that you can possibly be. So I recommend that to your listeners because I guarantee you it's a spiritual gift to yourself to give 100% effort to be everything that you can be. Well, it's a, it's a, this is so inspiring because if you, know, you look at the, the athletes in history, uh, and, and I'll refer more to the, you know, the Olympic, the Olympic athletes, you know, the, the, the gold medal winners are the ones that go down in history. They're the ones that are celebrated. Uh, they're the ones that you know, people, people remember the, the, the bronze and maybe even, you know, the, the bronze could have been a fraction of a second off from the gold. <laughs> and That's then fourth right. place, nobody even remembers. And you, so you look at just the, the tiny margin that exists between, you know, those first, second and third, third place. And it is, it's, it's incredible that, uh, you know, the, the ones that go down in history, it's just a fraction. It's a hair. It's that tiny bit of effort. And I've heard before that, you know, in our day and age, uh, good effort is going to give you poor results. Uh, you know, Excellent effort is going to give you mediocre results. It's the outstanding effort that gives you uh, those moves. It, it's a rung on the ladder toward Maslow's, you know, self-actualization. And it's it's powerful that you say that because it is. It's it's not that those that su- succeed and excel and achieve that excellence do so much more than everybody else, right? It's just a little bit more than that threshold that most people stop at That's and right. settle it's a, with. Just a little bit more. It's just a little bit more. And, and, but they're doing it for themselves. You yes. know, nobody's forcing them to do it. Uh-huh. So LeBron James is out on the basketball court as a kid at night shooting hoops. You know, nobody's forcing him to do that. Okay. But. As you said, that compounds, effort. right? It, it, it compounds. It, yeah. It, it creates the way in which you view your role in everything in, in that behavior side of things is, you know, it is, it's a, it's that compounding because the detection of making that just little bit extra effort uh, is, is noticeable. The other stuff is, ju- you know, it's the cliche of people just doing enough to get by. It becomes a way of life. Exactly. Yep. That's, amazing. So, That's so amazing. From just doing whatever you can get away with, you know, <laughs> which is the way some people approach work. You know, oh yeah. You do, yeah, you do as you do as much as you need to do, or you know, what can I get away with doing? What can I skip yeah. doing today? It's just a different orientation to how you approach. Hundred percent. That's so. It's approach, so amazing, you know. but it also is. You know, you look at the philosophy. You have everything you've just listed, and then you look at your, you know, your bio. And I know there's other there's other roles that you've played throughout your career, but you you're not surprised, right? If you were to, if to, to look at someone that has the philosophy that you have, the perspective you have, and then look at your experience, it won't be a surprise. So that's what's amazing. So I appreciate you sharing that. Well, it's one of the messages I try to uh, communicate in my memoir. I want to tell you a second message because we made we, the second point of just briefly. I wrote my memoir in part because I'm really concerned about kind of this negative tone that's developed in the country, you know, where uh, with regards to the political divisions and cultural divisions and racial divisions. And uh, we seem to dwell incessantly on the negatives, you know, what's wrong, what, what divides us. And from my perspective, you know, I look at this country today compared to America in the 1960s. And I say that, gee, if you had described America today to people in the 1960s, most people would have said, this country could not possibly change that. 
It's impossible. But we have. And it's such a better country. And we ought to give ourselves credit for how much the country has, has accomplished with regards to race relations and cultural issues. Uh, but, but even as we recognize it's not perfect, we still have a ways to go. There's much to do, but give ourselves credit for how far we've come. And, you know, that's, that's important to our collective psyche. It's just like if you raise a child, you can't always be negative and say, well, you know, yeah, okay, but you didn't get this done and you didn't get that done and you're not good at this and you're not good at that. If you're raising a healthy child, you've got to praise them for their achievements and accomplishments and then say, and also, there are some areas where you could get better, you know, some things you ought to focus on because that's not quite up to par with other things that you've accomplished. But you've got to have that balance for the psyche, the, the, the the, because psychologically, you're trying to help your kid understand that you are capable of these achievements. Look at how much you've done already. And now there's a little bit more that you need to also get done. And that same thing is true of our society. And so I wrote my, my book in part to try to communicate that message that our country ought to be really proud of how far we've come with regards to race relations. Uh, women's equality, the LGBTQ uh, acceptance in society. Uh, and, you know, we're a country, nobody came in from the outside to impose these changes on us. You know, the country has decided to try to live up to its higher standards, its higher ideals. And, uh, and we should be proud of how far down that road we You know, I heard... There's a saying that I've kind of connected with this year that is uh, pessimism gives you the crumbs of, of life. And if you look at just, there's always going to be something wrong, right? If you look for it, we're humans. If we're humans, exactly. We're humans, there's but there's always, but, uh, what's right is also always there. Exactly. It is there. So when I look at America today, you know, I see that in every profession, law, medicine, business, every academic field, uh, entertainment, sports, law, government, African Americans have achieved at the very highest levels, recognized and accepted. And in the middle of the uh, spheres of our society, Af millions and millions of African-American families have been lifted out of poverty through the access to better, better education and better economic opportunities that have, that have occurred in the last 50 years. And we want to be proud. An African-American has been elected president of the United president States. He's one of the most yeah. influential presidents. Exactly. And we should be proud of that. Yeah. Doesn't mean that Black Lives Matters doesn't have a good point when they when they march and demonstrate against, you know, this violence against unarmed black men that occurs. But the truth is those kinds of incidents of violence against unarmed black men occur in pro proportionately, the frequency was 50 times greater 50 years ago, and 100 years ago, 100 times greater. And I'm not sure we'll ever completely eliminate it because as you just said, we're, it's humans and there are gonna be some bad apples who really dislike other people for some nasty reasons. So I'm, never, I'm not sure we'll ever be rid of it entirely. Uh, and you know, Black Lives Matters is right to to demonstrate and publicize the incidents which still occur, but at the same time, we should recognize the frequency is greatly diminished, and we should recognize that that does not take away from how much our society has accomplished in the last fifty years. So we could be proud of what we've done, 
even as we recognize that we still have a ways to go. We're never going to be a perfect society. We still have a ways to go. Yeah, we're humans. We're fallible. And I, I think since the beginning of time, right, anything that's different or is perceived as different, people are afraid, are, are naturally afraid of. And I think it just goes to like our, you know, the caveman inside of us, you know, being afraid that, uh, you know, the saber toothed tiger is going to eat us in the morning. Right. I don't know. I, I look at that, but I also, you know, see so much good that's happening in the, in the world. Uh, and obviously the news headlines, it's easy to get the chemicals in our brain firing uh, because of the, the negative things that are happening. But There's so much good that's happening if you know where to look for it. Uh, and Anyway, we can go. We can go off on that. Uh, but I, I really believe that you know the focus that you have on how you show up with the different roles you have in life. There's going to be an overwhelming amount of things that are wrong, but there's going to be just as much, probably more, that you could be grateful for and, and what's right. You just have to look for it and train you have yourself. To see it. You have to look for it. And you have to see it. You have to appreciate it. But and, Tom, and, how you know? And one of my tenets would be associate yourself. <laughs> with those who are positive people, the positive events, the positive dynamics. You individually need to be a positive person and associate with positive people. And I'd also say that, you know, because I, in the past, I thought about disassociating with negative people. And I don't know if that's always the right thing, because in the end, what influences a person that may be pessimistic, naturally pessimistic, is you changing first. Right, you essentially adopting a different perspective, a different state uh, in which you show up, and that person over time will be will be influenced. Now, you know it is having an awareness of that. Uh, you know, instead of you know, just assuming that that person is going to be influenced of you or by you, but also it just shows that you know the people in the world that I would say are the most pessimistic are the ones that are suffering the most, and you could be a positive influence to them if you you know understand these principles and then show up different. That's, that's ultimately what's going to be the greatest influence. I agree with that. That was well said. I agree with that. So Tom, so Tom what, I, what I would, I wanted to really get into investment and we've just talked about really our philosophy and, and I, I love what you said and I, you know, it just, it, it, it magnifies the, the respect and admiration I have for you. So maybe just a few questions on, on finances and, and investment. Uh, and I think the best one is just how, this life experience that you've had and the perspective you have uh, in regard to just yourself, life, uh, our, our society, especially Western society, the American society, how have, you, how have you taken that to the financial world? Whether it's uh, you know, the, the way in which you've run these massive companies and the theory behind how they invest. Now I know you're, a lot, you're in the private sector uh, as far as investment is concerned. Uh, so maybe it applies to the to the companies you invest in, and you know, uh, aligning your philosophy with theirs. Like, how have you taken what you've learned about uh, learned about life and brought that to the financial services uh, roles that you've played? Well, I'd, I'd like to give you two examples. One is at more of a microscopic personal level, because your listeners may have some questions with regards to, well, you know, how can they become wealthier? You know, how can they be financially more successful? So I just want to tell the anecdote. Uh, when, my, when, when my wife and I got married on our honeymoon in uh, 1975, I said to her, you know, that one of the things I was thinking about was that we were both working professionals. You know, we both had nice incomes. I said, you know, I've been thinking that if we could, we should try to live on one income. Because if we could live on one income and save the other, you know, and have, have some money that we can invest and try to build uh, economically, you know, build an economic future, we could, you know, this is the time to try to do that, you know, while we're young. Um, and, you know, I said, I'm not sure what we would invest in, but I know that in a capitalist society, you know, you're a lot better off having some capital <laughs> to invest and, you know, looking for opportunities to then build wealth by using wealth, right? She agreed, which, you know, seems self-evident 40 years later. But in fact, at the time, it meant we couldn't live the same lifestyle 
as many of our young dual income friends. You know, we, we, we couldn't have the same clothes, we couldn't go out to dinner as often, we couldn't take the same vacations and so on and so forth. My wife agreed. And within two years, we had a $25,000 nest egg. And we lived in Boston at the time. And so one Sunday, I'm reading the Boston Globe, and the Boston Redevelopment Authority had some ads for abandoned properties that they had taken over, which were available for redevelopment. We lived in the south end of Boston, which at that time was in the early stages of urban renewal. One of the properties that the Boston Redevelopment Authority advertised was two boarded up, abandoned, burned out brownstone, about, you know, a little over two blocks from Copley Square in Boston, which is hard to believe today with, with you know, as much of that area that is developed. Yeah. We put in an application to redevelop those two brownstones. We were the only people in the whole city of Boston to even bid on it, okay? Um, three years later, uh, you know, through a lot of, it's a long story, a lot of, a lot of hurdles, a lot of tough stuff to deal with. Two years, three years later, we had completed a 10 unit apartment building, you know, totally refurbished apartment building. We lived in one of the units, top floor. We had a two bedroom apartment with a roof deck that was overlooking Copley Square. The other nine units uh, were cash flow positive. The building was cash flow positive within a year, which meant that you know that income was paying down the mortgage, which accrued to our benefit, of course. And then in, in that era, there were all kinds of tax advantages to owning investment real estate. And you know, also we were living essentially free, rent free, while the asset was growing in value. And we ended up making hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, at, in, out of that initial investment. And that's a microcosm of how, how, how you get from nowhere to somewhere in America financially. You know, it's not just what you earn on your job. It's what you do with what you earn. And you, you need to try to get capital, accumulate some capital somehow so that you can, in a capitalist society, you need to have the advantages of having capital work for you, you know, so that, so that you can get the capital gains and the income that is thrown off by capital. And all that Wall Street does is, you know, that example I gave you, Wall Street is just a magnification you know, a, a million scale magnification <laughs> of what I described to you, more complexity in, in some of the kind of deals, but it's essentially various versions of, you know, there's an equity piece of capital, there's some debt layered around it, and then there's some kind of asset, be it a building or be it a business, and you're trying to build that asset with the combination of the equity and the debt. And if you're successful in building that asset, it pays down the debt for you. And you end up owning the whole thing, even though your equity portion was only a fraction of what it cost. Mm -hmm. And you know that's, that's what happens in capitalist economies. And you need to understand that and make it work for you personally. Yeah, I, there's a saying I love, which is when you have when you have capital or liquidity, opportunity seeks you out. And it's not that it wasn't there before; it was always there. It's just if you don't have the means to do it, it's kind of like your brain uh, doesn't see it. it. It's an interesting interesting phenomenon. So I love I love that example. Maybe let's fast forward to to today because you've taken the wealth of knowledge that you've you know accumulated over the course of time and experience, most importantly. And now you you know you run a you run a, a VC type of uh, type of fund, and you're investing in different companies and other assets. Like what what do you what do you see as what are you paying attention to? What what do you see as the opportunity that exists uh, right now? And of course, there's a lot of things that you can focus on that are negative, right? Uh, but at the same time, there's also a lot of positive things that you can focus on. Like what are what are you and and your 
uh, you know, investment strategies focused on right now? Well, when I started 15 years ago with the venture business, my, my theory was that, uh, and this has changed a little bit in the last 15 years, but my theory at that time was that venture capital had become uh, something of a concentrated industry. You know, most of the capital, so to speak, uh, under the control of a relatively small number of medium and larger size venture capital firms, you know, typically on the East and, uh, and West Coast, and that these firms had accumulated such large pools of capital that smaller deals, meaning five and $10 million type deals, didn't move the needle for them. Meaning that, you know, if, if, you've, if you've got a $500 million fund, you know, a $10 million deal is just 2%. And it takes a lot of work, you know, to if you're going to try to make your fund successful with doing deals that are only 2% of the fund. And, 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 you know, it takes as much work, due diligence, document structuring, and so on, to do a $10 million deal as it does to do a $50 million deal. So my theory was there's an inefficiency that's developed in this marketplace where these, what I would call, uh, smaller uh, commercial size, smaller industrial size opportunities don't really have as much money, look, don't have as much sophisticated investment money looking at them as do the larger transaction. And so, uh, you know, and that was true at that time. So shortly after we got started, I'll give you an example. Um, we had a $60 million fund. And uh, my, uh, you know, I would network. I, and over the over the course of my career, you know, I've come to know a lot of a lot of people. And so one day I'm having lunch with somebody I had known for a number of years, who's also an investor, and he says, "Tom, you know, we're in this deal with a company called Floor and Decor Outlets of America, and we." which does hard surface stone tile, you know, but, uh, and he said, you know, we helped them to grow uh, to five stores. You know, it was an entrepreneur started it out. We helped them to grow to five stores, but they have violated one of the debt covenants that supports their inventory. And the bank is gonna pull the plug, you know, in the next 60 or 90 days. And it says, we're at the limits of how much money we can put into the deal. Would you be willing to consider investing? And I said, well, I'll tell you. I said, I, I'll tell you that I, I will do my diligence. I can do that. I will do an intensive look at it. And I can give you a decision within that time frame. But I'm not going to promise you that to do it. So I went and I spent a lot of time with the entrepreneur. And it turned out the entrepreneur, the leader of the company, was a brilliant entrepreneur by the name of Vincent West, who had a family company down in Georgia that had been wiped out by the early stages of Home Depot. But this guy, Vincent, as a kid, <clears throat> he had learned this business, you know, the stone, the tile, ceramics, and so on, different types of wood. And he had developed relationships with all the sources of this product around the world, the different quarries, the different manufacturers. And his idea was this. He says, you know, if you, Tommy says, if you're remodeling your house, uh, you have your interior designer come, he gives you some ideas, you like the ideas, you go down to the, to the tile shop, you see something that you like, you order it there, it goes through like six different pairs of hands, you know, because the tile shop doesn't have it in stock. They're going to order it from the distributor and the distributor doesn't have it in stock. He's going to order it from the importer and, you know, the importer's got to get it, you know, and it goes through the shipper. And then so, and everybody's adding 20% markup. So his idea was, let me import really unique product. I'm going to put it in 50, 60,000 square foot warehouses, okay? I'm going to put up these kind of 
beautiful examples, almost artistic types of examples using that real product of here's what you can do folks design wise with the product so that when you come in with your interior designer, if you see something that you like, it's right there in my warehouse. And this eliminates one of the problems, you know, he says, when you go to the local design store and you see something you like, when it finally gets imported through all these different pieces of hands, it may not even be the same as what it looked like in the store because it's coming from the quarry. It's coming from the rock. And, and, and so some of the little colors in it, the grains may be a little bit different. So this was his idea. Now, the problem with this business model, this type of business model, Patrick, is that you have to be really precise with the modeling of your revenue versus cost because all of your cost is up front. You got to get the store. You've got to get all the inventory into the store. You've got to hire all the people to be in your store. You've got to train them. So all the expense meters running. And unless you really understand how the revenue curve will build, it's very easy to run out of cash, okay? And so this was the problem. And when I did my due diligence, I figured this guy has a business model, you know, through these five stores that they've got going, you know, he's got a good idea. And it looks to me like they've pretty much learned how to operate the model, but they made a few errors with regards to some of these unpredictable very timing variables. So I offered them a deal, I said, I'll, I'll put in $2 million and cure the bank covenant, the, the bank default, the covenant default. And you know, people think you're gonna screw them in a circumstance like that. I said, and what I'm gonna do, I said, I will come in peri passu with the economic term of your current, you know, most recent round. So that's pretty generous. I said, but here's what I want. I'm gonna be peri passu economically, but I want a separate class of security. So if, if your last round was series B preferred, I want a separate round, which is series C or B series B1. And series B1 covenants are going to say that under, under circumstances where everything's fine, you know, budget and all of that, everything's peri passu. But there's going to be a whole list of conditions if we miss budget, if we have any default on bank debt, if we want to raise new debt, if we want to raise new equity, anything like that, you're going to have to have a majority of the Series B1, i.e., in effect, I have negative control. If everything goes well, we all share the economic. If there are problems, I've got the seat at the table, right? So to make a long story short, you know, put in two million, then a couple of years later, put in another 2.8 million, we grew that out to 25 stores, a two, uh, $250 million revenue runway. We sold it to Aries Capital Management out in LA. They scaled it up to over 50 stores and they took it public last year. FND is the symbol on the New York Stock Exchange. And um, so, you know, that's the kind of thing that we do a two million dollar initial investment scaling up to four and a half million, you know, and that was a 10 bagger for us, right? Um, and a, a larger fund wouldn't even look at a deal like that. Let me just make one last comment. What is changing though, and this has got me concerned, there's a lot more money in the venture world these days, a lot more angel groups, a lot more. Uh, it's just there's a lot more money chasing every kind of opportunity. So, um, you know, if we do one deal a year during a period like this, that's a lot because, you know, it just there's a lot of money chasing them. And I think what happened with WeWork in terms of, you know, the market kind of saying this is crazy, you know. <laughs> These values, they've gotten out of control. You're just throwing money at a guy and they're losing, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars a year. So I think, maybe, I hope that that'll bring some sanity back into the market. Uh, well, there's a, you know, there's a big article in the Wall Street Journal, you, I think it was last week or a few, a few weeks ago, 
which just talked about, you know, the uh, hundred billion dollars or so like dis- you know, disappearing. And a lot of it was initiated by, uh, you know, the WeWork uh, debacle, but not just that. It's also, you know, just what happened with Uber, uh, you know, and some other, you know, companies that were betting on a certain valuation. But, but I wonder what, what I wanted to get into, because I totally, I totally love this train. And I, I look at, again, going to where your expertise had been uh, established over the years, uh, would, you, would you maybe just, well, let's kind of end with this. What were, with this, with this deal, uh, what were the ingredients of your engagement in the deal? It sounded like, number one, it was the actual uh, individual, the entrepreneur behind the company. And then the second ingredient sounded like, uh, understanding their finances, right? Understanding where their finances were, their costs, and then what costs would be, and, and as well as revenues if they start scaling. Uh, that was the other. And then another ingredient that I picked up on is the terms of, of the deal. Uh, was there anything else in there as far as like your recipe for a good deal that uh, you, have, you maybe use uh, uh, consistently with some of the other deals that you do? Well, you're, you're pretty, pretty accurate. I would describe it as first and foremost, what is the product? You know, what, what does this company do? Okay. And so, um, you know, so that's what problem is it solved? Well, what does this company do? So in the case of FND, you know, it was solving that problem of, of, of going through multiple layers of, you know, markups in order to get home improvement supplies that were really attractively done and artistically set up and so on and so forth. So product, then value, you know, what's the value creation that accrues from your product? Because the value creation tells you, well, here's what people are likely to pay for it, right? So his design, his setup enabled them to get like, you know, 40% gross margins, even while they were selling at 40% less than you would have paid in the, in the, in the tile store, okay? The local tiles. So that was the value creation. And then the third element was the people, okay? And you can, I'm not saying it's always in that order, but those are the three elements. You know, what is the product? What's the value equation? Here? And who are the people? What's the quality of the team? Because at the end of the day, you're betting on people, right? You're betting on people, but good people can fail if you've got a poor product concept or a poor value equation. The other thing also happens, you can have a good product concept and a good value equation, but if you don't have good people, that doesn't work either, you know? So you need all three of those elements. Well, this has been, Tom, this has been fascinating. and. I wish we could go on for another hour. Uh, you know, I, I look at uh, probably the best way I would say to, to learn about you is probably going to be from your book. But is there any other anything else that you're doing, whether it's uh, you know, some, anything online uh, or anything that, that's uh, public other, other than your book where people can learn more about you, uh, you know, learn, learn from you, learn from your expertise? What's the, what's the best way for people to connect with you? Well, my Facebook page uh, from Willard Street to Wall Street uh, is obviously focused around the book, but I add, you know, on a regular basis, I do commentary uh, on that Facebook page. And then uh, my firm website is twjcapital.com. And uh, there you'll see a little bit of information about the kind of investments we do. And is the best way to get your book just through through Amazon or yeah, Amazon the publisher? Or what's the what's the best way to do Amazon, that? Amazon has it, and uh, they also have an audio version, you know, which is done by Audible. So if you're one of those people that while you're driving you like to listen to the book, you can get the audio version uh, at either Audible.com or since Audible is owned by Amazon, that's also available through Amazon. From Willard Street to Wall Street. Well, Tom, this has been such a such a pleasure, and thank you for sharing all that you uh, all that you've shared. It, it, there are there's some fundamental principles in there that I just I'm, I'm so excited about, and hearing it from you makes me even more excited. And I'm grateful for your uh, you know taking the time to be with us. It's been over an hour, believe it or not, but thank you. It, it's been 
Uh, it's been an incredible interview. Would you like to depart with any final words? Well, I would just say thank you for taking the time to do this. And to me, it's an example of what the opportunity of social media is. You know, we see so much that people say social media is so negative. Uh, but this is an example of your being able to take the time to really develop this topic, I think is a wonderful example of how you can add value through social media. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Tom. We'll have to have you on again. I'd look forward to it.